This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jacinta Thompson, and I'm the Executive Director and Exhibition and Events Producer for the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre. Before we begin tonight, I would like to acknowledge that we meet on Ghana land. We wish to express our respect for the Ghana people, their elders and ancestors, and acknowledge the spiritual and cultural relationship they have with their traditional land. Gives me great pleasure to welcome you all here tonight on behalf of the Hawke Centre and the University of South Australia to our presentation of Can Trees Talk, Think and Heal? And I would like to warmly welcome our international guest, Dr. Brian Pickles, and our interstate guest, Associate Professor Monica Galliano, and of course, our very own South Australian brilliant facilitator, Professor Chris Daniel. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. We are thrilled to be co-presenting this event in arrangement with Womadelaide's Festival's Planet Talks program. And I would like to thank Ian Scobie and Vic Pisani for their great work in not only WOMAD but the Planet Talks program and it's great to have the, to continue this um, wonderful co-presentation with Planet Talks and WOMAD and may it continue. The Hawke Centre is committed to delivering a free and diverse program of events and exhibitions throughout the year which reflect our fundamental themes of strengthening our democracy, valuing our diversity and building our future. The session tonight is being recorded and a video of the event will be available on our website, the Hawke Centre website, next week. As we are filming, can I please ask that you switch your phones to silent so that we don't have any interruptions. But for those of you, please feel free to follow us on Twitter at the Hawke Centre and join in the conversation using hashtag tree talk. So, I'm now going to hand over to Professor Chris Daniels, who is actually the director of the Cleveland Wildlife Park, and who is going to facilitate, which I know, having spent some time in the green room with the three of them, it's going to be a very interesting and lively conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacinta. And I'm absolutely thrilled to be here and to be part of this fantastic session and part of the program that the Hawke Centre delivers and has done now for quite a number of years uh, in partnership with the University of South Australia. And I think most of you who know me know that I've been a, a zoologist for some 40 years and I'm absolutely delighted to be involved in a session where we look at the intelligence and communicative ability of organisms. And we're going to explore how organisms think, feel, interact interact, how they communicate, learn, and even remember. And we're going to be discussing really important biological topics, such as the importance of the brain, how neural networks work, how uh, intelligence, how the internet tells us about life. We're going to look at swarm intelligence, mindless cognition, organisms possessing consciousness, and how they exploit other life forms to transmit information and material. Now, you'd think we'd be talking about animals, but we're not going to do that. That's pretty easy anyway. We're going to be doing it around plants because we now know sorry, that trees are far more alert, social, sophisticated, and even intelligent than we thought or ever could have imagined. As long ago as 1880, Darwin ruminated on the possibility of plants having an intelligence network in their roots when he concluded in his 1880 book, The Power of Movement in Plants, that it is hardly an exaggeration to say that the tips of the radical, which means rudimentary root, have the power of directing the movements of the adjoining parts and act like the brain of one of the lower animals. Although Darwin's ideas on intelligence were not immediately followed up, 
I guess everyone was concentrating on a few other things he'd been cooking up. That, the idea that plants can communicate has always been an intriguing idea. In 1969, the movie musical Paint Your Wagon starred that wonderful crooner Clint Eastwood and he sung the song, I talk to the trees but they never listen. Since then, of course, there's been Tolkien's ants and a number of other fanciful talking botanical creatures. But is all of this conjecture at best or science fiction at least? Seems no. Science has found a whole mass of different research uh, to support new ways of looking at plants. And in particular, we have new scientists who are now out there listening to plants properly. And they have found that plant behaviour is known to be at least active and perhaps even purpose-driven and intentional. Plants appear to have the capability for self-recognition and even problem-solve. To these scientists, plants are now viewed as similar to other organisms which appear to be adaptive, intelligent and cognitive. So to help us understand this amazing new world of plants as sentient organisms, we have two of the world's leading plant whisperers. The pioneering scientists are Brian Pickles and Monica Galliano, who will help us explore the fascinating hidden world of tree communication and plant cognition. Galliano's research has uncovered thinking plants, while Pickles' work shows that plants use a whole other group of organisms, fungi, to generate complex communication networks, dubbed the wood wide web. Through this network, trees share, trade, care for family, display altruism, and even wage war. So we've got some ground to cover. So tonight, we're going to start off firstly by asking Monica and then Brian to tell us a little bit about themselves um, and how they came into the brave new world of plant communication. And while we're doing this, I was thinking of um, both Monica and Brian and the, the lyrics from the great songster Eccles from the Goons. Do you remember the Goons? A few of you remember the Goons? Who used to sing Clint Eastwood's song as, I talk to the trees, that's why they put me away. <laughs> so we're going to find out a bit about them first. Um, and then we'll examine the marvellous experiments that demonstrate plant communication, intelligence and learning and the work that they've been doing. And then finish up with what does all of this mean? So for, in what does it mean for understanding the biology and ethics of plants? What it means for understanding our world and our role in it? And just as intriguing, what does it change in the world of science where language, methodology and objectivity are prized above all? Maybe we need to think about science differently. As part of this process, we've been collecting some questions from the audience, and I've included that in my 11 pages of questions here. Have we got any questions? I've included your questions in here, and I'll read them out um, verbatim because I don't want to be accused of editing your questions, and they'll be in part of this. So let's get on with it. Starting you with you, Monica, tell us a little bit about yourself. <coughs> Well, they tried to put me away, but it didn't work, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, still here. Um, well, I am a research associate professor of evolutionary ecology, which is a mouthful to just say that I'm interested in uh, what organisms do in relation to their environment and over long time scales. <laughs> Um, I, I was trained as a marine scientist, and so much of my earlier work was on the ecology of coral reef fishes on the Great Barrier Reef. And, uh, and then I got interested into plants um, while I was asking the same questions that I used to ask uh, when I was working with animals. So for me, plants uh, became... Uh, simply the subject of the same question, and I didn't see them uh, as most of the plant sciences um, would see them. And I guess that's probably why I was able to ask questions that were not being asked, and, uh, and maybe that's probably why I was stupid enough to chase the answers for it. But I'm glad I did, and I guess that's why I'm here now. Thank you, Monica. Brian, a little about yourself. Sure. So I am a lecturer in ecology at the University of Reading in the UK. And uh, I also started out working on wildlife. My undergraduate degree was wildlife management at the University of Edinburgh. 
Uh, I ended up working with uh, invasive plants. I went out to Mauritius to look at invasive plants and native rainforests. Uh, and by the end of my wildlife management degree, I decided I was going to work with plants because they don't run away when you're trying to do experiments on them. And uh, eventually I decided I was going to take my uh, research career a bit further as I was sat in an office in Aberdeen doing data entry for a housing company and generally hating my life. <laughs> a friend called and asked if I wanted to go and work on sea turtles in Trinidad, so naturally I dropped the phone, ran out, and <laughs> that's what I ended up doing. Um, and then went to the University of Aberdeen did my master's in ecology and then my PhD in plant science, which is where I learned all about the wonderful world of mycorrhizal fungi. Um, after that, I worked in Canada for eight years. Uh, I worked with Suzanne Samard and her amazing group at the University of British Columbia. Uh, and then in 2015, I moved to the UK, which is where I'm based now. And, uh, at the moment, I'm teaching a course on reptiles and dinosaurs, which just goes to show sometimes you cannot escape your past. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Brian. So let's get down to it. How do we know that plants communicate? Well, let's look at the evidence, and I'd like to start with you, Brian. Tell us about the experiments with giraffes and acacias. Okay, so Chris surprised me a little with this question. It's not something I've actually worked on, but it's a very nice, clear demonstration uh, of plant communication. So giraffes, when they're eating uh, the leaves of acacia trees, they really don't like uh, tannins. And tannins are a plant defense chemical uh, that they activate in response to herbivory. So when a giraffe goes and starts eating the leaves of an acacia, uh, it's able to get these nice, fresh, tasty leaves. But the plant doesn't like this very much, and it starts producing tannins. And it also produces this chemical, uh, ethylene, which is spread through the air. And when another acacia detects the ethylene, it starts to trigger its own defense response. So the nearby acacias will start to produce tannin in response to a different plant being attacked by a giraffe and uh, researchers have seen that giraffes will actually uh, go quite a long distance from the first tree they've been eating to try and get around this uh, active plant communication response. So thanks for that one, Chris. You surprised me that, with that. I'd like to open with a curly one. Keep them on their toes. And the great thing about that is giraffes actually know that the plants are secreting these chemicals and telling other plants so they start feeding downwind so they can sneak up on the acacia um, in, in order to make sure they eat it quickly before it starts doing this stuff. So it was really one of the first demonstrations that one plant is sending signals to other plants. And that was in Airborne, but Monica, you've shown us that corn seedlings make clicking sounds, and you actually founded the whole area of plant bioacoustics. Maybe you can tell us about your experiments with corn and sound. Well, I guess... Um Again, coming from an animal behavioral background, um, sound is one of those things that is uh, widely studied and it would make sense to any human as well because most of our communication is uh, so focused on sound and how we speak and language and all of that associated to it. And um, so when you come from an animal background in, re in, in research, uh, the question of sound is just like, yeah, and which, uh, which model are you using for that? But it's nothing special. Uh, and yet, uh, when you look at other systems, suddenly you see that uh, one of the best signal to transfer information, acoustics, uh, might be, be totally overlooked. And so there is, I guess, many possibilities for that, but two are the obvious. One, they simply, that system doesn't use it. Or two, they use it and we haven't looked at it. And so it was a mixture of uh, personal interaction and uh, with various bodies of knowledge, including the literature from anthropology, where a lot of the stories from all sorts of cultures around the world talk about humans and plant communicating and literally communicating using sound and um, humans listening to the sound of plants. And I was like, okay, and this story has been there for a long time. So either it's a story that we really like and keep <laughs> repeating, but from an evolutionary perspective, 
evolution, even in terms of culture and knowledge, has a tendency to kind of remove the stuff that is not really useful. So for a story like that to remain in our culture for so long, well, maybe there is something in it that it's useful. And, uh, and so the first step was to test whether, well, do plants actually emit any sound? Or do they perceive sound? Can they? And uh, so the experiment that you're referring to with the corn was kind of the first attempt to test for that question. And the way in which you do that is quite straightforward. Uh, you um, play back, which is something, again, uh, is a technique that is used like, routinely with animals. So you record a particular frequency, and then you play it back. And, uh, and you see what the other, in this case the plant, uh, is going to do in response, if it's responding at all. And so when we did that, um, we played back you know, first 100 hertz, and then 200 hertz, 300 hertz. And, um, and the question, of course, is like, OK, if this was a bird, maybe you think the bird is going to fly away if it doesn't like the sound. But what is the plant going to do? Plants don't do things, right? They don't behave. Uh, but of course, when you ask this kind of question, you have to be open to be shown what the other can do, even if you're not sure exactly what it is that you're looking for. And so what the plant, uh, in this case, what the corn seedlings did was at a particular frequency, only at a particular frequency, their roots started bending um, towards the sound source instead of growing straight to gravity. And they only did that between 200 and 300 hertz. And then for the other frequencies that we were playing back, they were just growing with gravity straight. And of course, that doesn't say that they didn't hear those frequencies. It just says that they're not kind of interested. And um, why? We don't know. And why would they lie to 100, 300 hertz? We also don't know yet. But of course, that opens, and I think this is a good sign of healthy science, when there are more questions open than no answers found. And this is exactly one of those situations where, yeah, too many questions. And, and that <laughs> experiment then, Monica, was uh, replicated by David Attenborough in one of his Curiosities programs. Was no, he was actually sitting on my chair. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to say, when he came to, because that was done with colleagues at the University of Bristol, and when uh, we were told that uh, Sir Davo, as Sir we Davo, called it, yep, that's the Australian way, <laughs> um, was coming to the lab, of course, he was like, yeah, well, it's cool. But, you know, who cares? <laughs> then he turned up. <laughs> and he was like, he speaks like him. <laughs> <laughs> it's him. <laughs> and then when he sat on my chair, <laughs> then was like, oh, wow. And he's talking about my experiment. He's talking about my plans. <laughs> and of course, we were up because we didn't want to disturb the recordings for the, for the episode. So all of us were sitting outside the lab, looking in through the little square window, typical of like doors that lock up labs. And we were all like, it's him. It's him. <laughs> so yeah, there. <laughs> I'm in awe of someone who had David Attenborough's bottom in her chair. I can tell you. <laughs> um, so that opens, of course, the, the question that most people ask, which is how can plants sense if they don't have neurons? Discuss. <laughs> so in a very different way to the way that we sense things, of course. Um, plants can detect chemicals and respond to the production of chemicals. Uh, they respond to um, enzymes and uh, other compounds that are exuded into the soil, for example, by other organisms. Um, and of course, you've shown all sorts of different responses. Uh, we were talking earlier about um, Kew Gardens uh, in the UK has all these mimosa plants. I'm sure most people have heard of mimosas. Those are the ones where you touch the leaves and then they curl up as a defense response. Uh, in Kew Gardens, they don't curl up anymore because so many people have been walking around, oh, look at the mimosa, see if it, see if it will respond, and they don't anymore. So you, you can tell that, uh, that they're able to respond to touch as well. Well, my uh, take on that would be slightly different. <laughs> <laughs> and it would turn the question to you. 
back. It was like a boomerang. Oh. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm asking the question. Uh, well, the question then would be this. Why would you need neurons? Why would you need a brain and neurons, so the central nervous system, to be sensitive to the environment? In actual fact, even humans and other animals which have brains and neurons of different sizes, um, most of the time do not make the decision uh, in a rational way. So by thinking about it and using that beautiful brain to reach the appropriate conclusion, most of our decisions are made uh, basically on a rule of thumb. So the, the technical term is heuristics, and they're basically like gut feelings and like uh, common sense and all of those. And uh, they do not need the brain to intervene. And in fact, it's good that it, the, the brain doesn't intervene because they, we are already so overwhelmed by informational fields that surrounds us all the time that if the brain had to process all of that, it would just uh, burn out straight away. <laughs> so it's a good mechanism not to use your brain. If you don't have one, and you are not going to waste your energy in evolutionary terms to create one, you might have worked out something very smart about processing information without having to do something so costly as the creation of a brain. So, so really, if you think about all of the information that's coming into any organism, it can actually be broken down to waves or chemicals bringing about various sorts of electrical changes in membranes. Yep. So it's not hard, actually, to have a, a chemical or physical change in causing a response in a membrane that brings around a cascade of effects. It doesn't matter whether it's, it's chemical, whether it, we just call it auditory because we've got ears. Well, also we have to remember that uh, what is a neuron? Neurons are cells which are specialised in transferring, transducing a signal of whatever kind into a common language. It's like uh, the Esperanto of a uh, cellular uh, world. And so they take all of these different signals and they transform them into electrochemical signals. Well, if there is one group of organisms that is absolutely masters at this, that is plants. They have exactly the same chemicals, exactly the same uh, electrical capacities, and, uh, and not by chance we say that, you know, the spark of life, because all life can do this, no matter what shape or form. So, the brain is just a very sophisticated way of doing that. Sophisticated doesn't mean special. It just means one way. Okay, so if you think the brain is a special way of processing lots of electrochemical signals, Brian, tell us about root tips. Root tips. So most of the time when you think about, or when, when we're thinking about plants, we're not thinking about what's going on below ground. Uh, Often when I go to a conference, I like to show a picture of a tree and put a big arrow pointing at it saying, this is not a tree, and then give people a few minutes to say, what on earth is he on about? Well, there's just as much going on below the ground that we don't see as there is above it. Uh, root tips of plants are interacting with the soil environment uh, to extract water and to extract nutrients, uh, which then get transferred into the tree. Except most of the time, it's not actually the plants that are doing that. And uh, most of my research is focused on these fungi that form symbiotic associations with plants. And they colonize the roots of plants. They're much smaller. They're able to get into all these fine pores in the soil where there's water locked up uh, and nutrients. And they can break down some of these nutrients. And then they transfer them back to the plant. So, those root tips are interacting with other organisms in the soil to do all sorts of different things. They're exuding chemicals into the soil, which could be uh, chemicals for defense or chemicals to signal to other organisms that they would like to form an association. Uh, and they're exploring this environment, usually below our feet, and we don't give it a second thought. So could you tell us a bit more about fungi? I mean. I just, just assume I don't know a lot about fungi, um, except for the tasty ones and the things that grow between your toes, and yeast, of course. Um, tell us, they're a kingdom unto themselves, not plant, not animal. Indeed, and they're eukaryotes, like us. 
They are heterotrophs, which means they don't produce their own energy, they extract it from uh, other living material. So plants are autotrophs, they photosynthesize, they generate uh, their own sugars through that process, and uh, fungi have to get their carbon through breaking down uh, other uh, biological material uh, or forming associations with uh, plants uh, or other organisms that can uh, produce their own food, essentially. Yeah, they can be parasites as well as... They can be parasites, and normally when people think about fungi, they either think about the mushrooms uh, that they're eating with their dinner, or they think about uh, fungal diseases uh, of humans or fungal diseases of trees. Um, very rarely do we give much thought to all of the really important uh, positive uh, mutualisms that are going on in the environment due to fungi. So you've got this situation where plants exchange information through leaves and flowers. Got that. Now we're saying that root tips are really important for both giving out and receiving signals, because they're the pointy end of the, the underground part. And you've got these mycorrhizal fungi spreading all out and connecting. How did you show that? Tell me the experiment with the bear and the salmon. Okay, so this is a Simard Lab experiment. Um, this isn't one that I've done myself, but I know the people who are involved in it. Um, when salmon come into a river, they have just come from the open ocean. The open ocean uh, has a different uh, quantity of a uh, nitrogen isotope in it. Most of the time when we think about isotopes, we're thinking about Geiger counters and radioactivity in science fiction movies. Uh, but all elements have uh, different isotopes that may be stable or they may be radioactive. And it's a measure of uh, the number of neutrons that that element carries. A lot of the experiments that I've been doing uh, look at different isotopes uh, of elements and depending on the environment that the isotope comes from, it can tell you about uh, where uh, that, that actually originated. So what the group that have been working with bears and salmon uh, have been looking at is you can actually see the signal of marine nitrogen that has been introduced into a forest by salmon. So the salmon come into the river from the marine environment, bears catch the salmon, and then they take them into the forest to eat them. And then the rotting remains of the salmon get absorbed by fungi, and you can trace this uh, 15N from the salmon into nearby trees because it's been picked up by fungi and then transferred through their hyphae into the trees. And uh, there's been some great research in British Columbia showing that you can actually see when there have been really good salmon runs based on the N15 content uh, in trees. So it actually leaves uh, a characteristic uh, trace inside the tree that you can detect by doing elemental analysis with some very expensive machinery. <laughs> but that's, that's really an incredibly exciting find because you've then been able to build on that to go, okay, salmon rots, picks up by fungi, puts into trees. And then the trees can do all sorts of things with that material back into the fungi. And you've shown that they will support their offspring, but not others. They, you will have mother trees looking after a distances trees a long way away. Tell us about those experiments. So uh, the idea of mother trees is that um, essentially you have these big old trees, maybe Douglas fir in those Pacific Northwest forests, uh, and they support this huge community of uh, symbiotic fungi. I always think about fungi, there's always bacteria and other uh, microorganisms involved in this process as well. But essentially you have these big old trees that form networks uh, with fungi, and the fungi can extract uh, minerals, water, um, other nutrients from the soil and then transfer them back to the tree, but they can also get transferred from the mature trees to seedlings nearby. So I've done some work with a great master's student who just graduated uh, this last, last year, uh, Gabriel Orego, who's uh, in Chile now. And uh, what we were doing there was coming up with a way to actually inject labeled sugars directly into a mature tree and then trace where those sugars went in the environment. 
So normally the tree is producing its own sugars through photosynthesis. It will transfer those down into the roots and transfer them into the fungi in exchange for different nutrients. So what we were able to do in this case was inject a labeled compound, so a sugar that had an identifiable isotope on it, and then look to see where that isotope ended up. And we found it in nearby uh, seedlings that were just starting to grow on some decaying logs nearby. And of course, it's not all the nearby seedlings. It can be the seedlings of the mother, but not the seedlings of some other mother who can look after themselves, <laughs> really. Yeah. So that also, you've expanded into work with two species, with fir and birch. Beach. Fur and birch. Birch. I always get those two wrong. <laughs> so tell us about those experiments. How, why do those two species link together through fungi? Well, Douglas fir and birch occur in the same habitat. Uh, they're both widely distributed tree species. Um, and in fact, it was Suzanne Samard who did the first experiments on this. And she was able to show that there was bi-directional carbon transfer between Douglas fir and birch. So she labeled the Douglas fir with one isotope of carbon and the birch with another isotope of carbon, and then was able to detect where those isotopes ended up. And not only did uh, the Douglas fir transfer things to other Douglas fir, but it also transferred it to birch. And at different times of the year, there were different amounts of transfer back and forth between them. So most of the work that I've done has actually been on the seedlings, trying to do much more uh, small-scale controlled experiments in lab environments, uh, looking at what happens when you label one seedling with different uh, isotopes. Uh, where do they end up in the system when you have multiple plants? Uh, do they transfer them to each other? Do they hold on to themselves? Do they only give it to the fungus? Lots of interesting questions about this, which really get at how plants are involved in resource transfer. Uh, and of course, when we're dealing with lab experiments, we've got a really simplified um, system. So we think about doing lab experiments as being, well, it's very controlled, it's very scientific. Well, it's scientific in that it allows us to look at one or two things very closely, but the natural world doesn't really work like that. And so that then brings us to our first question from the audience, um, from Kim Green, who actually was very taken with this whole idea, idea about transfer of information. And he writes, I am an organic apple and cherry grower commercially. All trees are grafted all planted at high numbers, e.g. 4,000 trees per hectare. My question is, would our trees be communicating with each other, and can we tap into that communication to help the system, given that the root system is different from the top half? I think, I think that's a really great question, and uh, seeing that question actually prompted me to go and have a look and see what research had been done uh, on apple trees and mycorrhizal fungi, and I discovered that an old friend of mine who was doing his PhD at the University of Aberdeen at the same time as me, and now works for the University of Sheffield, was involved in this research. And what they found was that uh, apple trees that are associating with arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi actually have an increased resistance to uh, a very nasty disease of apple trees, uh, Neonectrina fungus. Uh, which causes uh, massive loss of apple crops around the world. And they actually found that where their trees were colonized by arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, incidences of disease were reduced by about 20%. The other interesting thing that came out of that study was they found that if you added lots of nutrients to your plants, which is typically what you're advised to do when you're starting up a, a plantation, the higher levels of nutrients that were being added actually caused the plants to reduce the amount of uh, biomass that they grew below ground, so they had less uh, invested into roots and consequently less being invested into their mycorrhizal fungi. And having less uh, root capacity made them more, res uh, more susceptible to drought. And having fewer mycorrhizal fungi then makes you less susceptible to disease. So there's all these interesting mm. different balances that you have to think about uh, when it comes to uh, what you're doing with your plantation in this case. And my last question to you before switching the spotlight to you, Monica, is all of these interactions with fungi, with trees, with their siblings, with their top half and their bottom half, all that led Suzanne Simard to postulate the concept of the wood wide web. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? 
Sure. So I really like the idea of the wood wide web because it's pretty easy for us to grasp. Uh, whereas trying to understand how fungi are interacting with plants can be pretty difficult uh, to conceptualize. But if, you are a, if you're a plant, you're putting your roots into the soil and you want to extract nutrients and water because you need those for your survival. What most plants do is they form these uh, mutualistic associations with fungi. Now, fungi form a mycelium, uh, which can spread out through the soil uh, in these little microscopic hyphae. And the hyphae have a much greater surface area than plant roots could ever have, which means they're much better at extracting nutrients and water from small, isolated pockets, and they're much, uh, much more able to respond to sudden changes in the environment. Now, what this uh, hyphomycelium can do is it doesn't just necessarily connect up to one plant, but the same fungal mycelium can link two plants. It can link two plants of the same species, or in many cases, it can link plants of different species. It can link trees uh, to herbs, um, trees to grasses, and so on. And you can have uh, individual fungi that link up multiple plants from multiple species and you have multiple species of fungi. So hopefully you can start to see just how complex uh, the soil ecology is. Uh, and when we're talking about plants, it's really difficult to divorce them from uh, all of the different organisms that they're actually interacting with uh, just as part of their everyday life. So the idea of the wood wide web is that you have this vast network uh, of connections below ground that are linking up different plants uh, and capable of moving uh, resources, so water, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, and signals that are produced by the plants, picked up by the fungi, and can then be transferred into other plants. That's the wood wide web in a nutshell. And, and we hope it works a lot better than our NBN. That's really <laughs> uh, OK, so we've got this network of communicating plants and fungi of incredible complexity. And all that makes real sense. Then you come along, Monica, with mm -hmm. some experiments that push the boundaries of the communication even further. Have you been addressing memory, intelligence, and learning in plants? I wonder if we could start that topic by you telling us about your experiments, um, particularly with the one where you showed pea seedlings um, could learn that sound indicated they were going to get fed. So they learned to recognize feeding time. Well, first of all, I should say that um, the ultimate goal of all this uh, sharing of information, of course, is so that you can do something about it. <laughs> and, um, and you don't want to have to learn what to do with it every single time from scratch. And that's where learning as a process comes in. And of course, learning and memory, or well, actually memory is part of the learning process. You can't learn unless you can remember what happened yesterday and then modify what you're gonna do based on that experience. So memory doesn't exist just by itself. <laughs> um, so I guess the, um, the experiment that you're referring to, because you mix two, it's really oh, nice. Did I? No, no, oh. it's good. I like to. I, I would love to be able to explain them together, but it's gonna be complicated. <laughs> I did that on purpose. <laughs> so um, I think the one that you're referring to about learning is uh, the Pavlovian yes. P. And just to uh, give you a picture, if you're not already familiar with, because the example is so uh, famous, uh, this is exactly imagine or recall the Pavlovian dog, that's the original Pavlovian, uh, where Pavlov, which was a, um, a physiologist from Russia, uh, noticed in his lab that, you know, every time the, uh, there was this uh, bell ringing, the dog will be, and then uh, it would be presented, it would present the dinner to the dog, the dog will be, you know, coming and after a few days, recognizing that the bell was always coming before dinner and starting salivating even before dinner arrives. So within a few days, the dog learned something about the bell that initially didn't have any meaning whatsoever. It was just a bell. But suddenly, because it always, it's always fo this bell is always followed by dinner, the bell becomes meaningful. And the learning occurs through this process of experiencing. And the ultimate goal is that you can even remove dinner, and the bell on its own actually has this meaning. Dinner is coming. Now, 
Imagine an instead of a dog, which of course is like a, a, an animal with a big brain and lots of neurons, and you know, it's very close to us because most of us have them as pets, so we are finding it very easy to empathize with the fact that of course a dog can learn, and of course they, they are smart, and they are. Uh, sometimes, like in my case with my dog, they are smarter than you, and that's very confronting. <laughs> um, but aside from that, uh, it becomes even more confronting when your plants are doing that. <laughs> And um, so imagine the same situation. You have, instead of the dog, you have a, a pea, a green pea, a garden pea. And uh, instead of dinner for the garden pea is uh, a blue light, which we know very well, the plants, especially when they're little, uh, they really love. And then I needed to find something that would uh, kind of substitute the, or play the same role that the bell played in, in the dog experiment. And so I settled for a little tiny fan, which is really the, the kind of fan that you would find inside your laptop computers. And, um, and so just like in the experiment with the dog, I present the fan first, and then followed by dinner, the blue light. And the pea is growing inside this uh, maze. And the maze is very simple, it's a Y shape, so literally imagine the letter Y. And so there is the fan coming in and the light follow. And then I move the fan and the light follows. And then I do this randomly for a few days, three. And, uh, and then I test the P to see whether it's going to go left or right based on whether it's going to follow the last place where it saw the light, which is what they would do instinctively, so that doesn't require any learning, or whether the P would trust the fan which actually is totally meaningless unless the plant, just like the dog, has learned that the fan is always followed by dinner. So if I follow the fan, that's where dinner is going to come from. Well, what you find is actually the peas do go to the fan. And so just like the dog, the fan didn't have any meaning to the plants, but it has acquired meaning. And this meaning, of course, is a subjective value that each individual so each individual plant is giving to this signal. And to have a subjective experience, it means that someone, someone in there is evaluating what's going on and is making a decision based on experience. And in a way, just like for the dog, dinner, when you're testing it, and it's not like the dinner for the dog was not present, there was just the bell. And in this case with the pea, the light does never come at the end. It's only the fan. But the expectation of what's coming next, based on what is present, not only is extending your um, perception of the environment, because you're not just perceiving the environment that is actually there, but you're also extending it with a projection of what is about to come that is not there, but it's coming, and you know it based on your experience. So you're projecting into a future that doesn't exist yet. And in a way, the only place where that dinner for the dog and the light for the plant exists is in the imagination, it's in the mind of. Okay, we'll come, come back to that topic. It's a <laughs> remarkable experiment, it was a real, real uh, ground changer beaten only by one other experiment that you did, the one we talked about mimosa earlier, but the one about mimosa and memory. Yeah, mimosa was, um, was actually, mimosa came first for me. Oh. <laughs> because, why? Because um, often we don't uh, think of plants at all, <laughs> and, uh, and actually humans do suffer from a condition <laughs> Uh, fortunately, it's only cultural and it's not medical, so it can be fixed. <laughs> uh, and the name is plant blindness. And uh, actually, educational studies have shown that uh, kids at schools uh, find it very difficult to recognize plants, but they could tell you the names of animals that don't even live in their place. So they might not recognize uh, the, the basil plant, but they know what a lion looks like from pictures. So, um, and this was work that was done like in the 90s by uh, education researchers in the US. And, but this concept is re-emerging especially right now because of course we are realizing how important plants, not even important, how crucial plants are uh, for our survival and the, the survival of the entire planet. 
And so uh, the idea of curing culturally this uh, disease is to get us close to plants. And how do you get close to something that doesn't move? And we are geared, like our physiology is kind of geared to, to um, focus primarily on things that move. So for a plant to move as such a, to, uh, to our eyes doesn't move. Plants move way too slow or way too fast. And yes, way too fast. <laughs> In fact, until we had really fast cameras, we couldn't catch their movements because they were so fast. Take that. <laughs> But um, so I needed to find a plant to, to even start asking this kind of question. I needed to find a plant that uh, could be recognized by the human eye as, yeah, it's doing something, it's moving. And Mimosa is one of the few that has this ability to move at our time scale. Um, which doesn't make it special. <laughs> it just simply happens that it's at our time scale. And as Brian mentioned before, is the plant that if you touch it, it or disturb it in any way, will close the leaves. And in fact, it's also known as uh, touch me not or all sorts of other names, including the sensitive plant, uh, which in itself is quite interesting, but we can discuss that later. <laughs> and. Um, and basically, the idea was very simple, and it was looking using Mimosa as a model because we can see what the plant is doing, and um, can this plant learn to do something different, something new, which is you know what learning might allow you to do. And so I looked, I started with the what we consider the most simple and most basic way of learning, which is called habituation, and you're doing it right now. And uh, because you are habituated to the fact that there are the noises up at the top from the fans and uh, the lights, and you're not paying attention to those things because they are irrelevant. Your body has already decided that nothing is really going to happen. But if the fire alarm was going off right now, then you will be on alert and you will probably run out of the room. So the idea is of habituation is, can you stay alert to anything new that might arrive in your environment that you, are not, uh, you haven't learned the consequences of yet? And while not wasting all your energy trying to be alert about everything and ignore it, literally. Everything that you already know has got no consequences for your survival or your well-being. So in the case of Mimosa, uh, I dropped it. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. Yeah. So I created this little vessel. It's a bit like a roller coaster, right? So uh, this little vessel, the plant goes in the vessel, and the vessel is attached to this um, rod. And, uh, and I literally let it drop with gravity. It's a controlled drop, and no plants were hurt in the process <laughs> of these experiments, of course. Um, but um, of course, the, the, the expected and the correct reaction of, uh, of the plant to this kind of disturbance is like, close your leaves. You don't know what this is. And of course, the drop was uh, selected on purpose because it's totally ecologically irrelevant. <laughs> but that's done on purpose because how do I know that anything else that could be ecologically relevant the plant wouldn't know about it already. And then it just stuffs up my experiment. <laughs> so take something that is uh, totally impossible in, the, in a normal life of a plant of mimosa. Uh, and um, so you drop it, and the first reaction is like, I'm going to close because I don't know what this is. And then you do it again, and the plant closes again because I yeah, don't know yet. But then within a few drops, you're still dropping the plant, and the plant is reopening the leaves. And you're like, I think it's working out what this is. And what is working out is, this is really annoying. I hope it's, this stops soon. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't have any consequences for my life. And so why would I bother closing my leaves, which is really expensive, because every time you, your leaves are closed, you can't photosynthesize properly. Half of the photosynthetic efficiency drops. So suddenly, you're trading off between protecting yourself from a perceived possible threat and not feeding. But if the threat is actually, if you work out that there is no threat, then the logical thing to do is like just annoying, but keep feeding. And that's exactly what Mimosa did. And so then you, you, you leave it there for a while, <laughs> thinking like, I'll come back. 
I know you, you, you work this one out. I come back in uh, three days. Surely you don't remember. And I'll do it again. And I don't need to do a few drops. At the first drop, the plant is like, ah, oh, boring. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen this before. Here she is again, this woman again. <laughs> <laughs> so then you realize, oh, underestimated. OK, six days, thinking like, surely six days, same. So then I left it for a month, thinking like, come on, after a month, surely they don't remember. And they did. So if you thought that your dog might uh, show out, uh, uh, ignorant you are about the world and how smart he is, well, try and work with plants. When they show you <laughs> off like that, you really feel like, oh dear. <laughs> so that, those are two outstanding experiments that really challenge um, our perception of intelligence, which then when you link with the way that plants are talking to each other through fungi, we've got a whole different way of thinking about smarts, as you pointed out with, the, with your dog. So there's two, two issues around intelligence that I want to raise. Um, the first is intelligence is often linked to intentional behaviour or decisions. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned a few there around the Pavlovian peas. Do you think you need to be intentional to be intelligent? And the second form of intelligence that's been put forward is swarm intelligence. So I wonder if you'd like to comment on those two, intentional and swarm. Discuss. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, uh, intelligence f comes from the root base uh, inter which means uh, choose between. That's what intelligence is about, choice. And uh, whenever you are making a decision and you're choosing between options, there must be an intention for going towards one and not the other. And I would argue that um, all life has intend to survive and intend to thrive because um, that's what we actually see. Then we might want to simplify the model and only say that the humans has intention, just because that's the one that we are familiar with. And often we are not quite sure about our own intentions either. But, <laughs> um, but I would say that all life, uh, life doesn't just thrive. You need to go and search for your nutrients, look for your water, make alliances. Some alliances are convenient for a time and then they're no longer. Uh, you need to work out whether it's worthwhile closing, not closing, feeding, not feeding. It's like, why would you need to work it out if you're just working as a machine? You just do A plus B plus C and you, off you go. But they don't, nobody does that no matter what form of life you are. So I would argue, and I can imagine that this probably is uh, contentious, but I would argue that all life intend to be life. Swarm intelligence. Don't ask me about swarm intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we've gotten topped on it when we did I the Wood Wide Web. We did kind of touch on it on the World Wide Web. I was just thinking what Monica was saying there made me think about uh, how there are some trees out there that have been alive for 5,000 years. Mm -hmm. Indivi one individual tree, we're not talking about clones here, we're talking about an individual organism that has survived for 5,000 years, dealing with uh, long-term changes in climate, short-term changes, extreme events. Uh, and of course, the tree is associating with all these other organisms. Um, you can't survive 5,000 years without some form of intelligence. Call it ecological intelligence, if you will. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the issues that we have as humans in trying to define intelligence is that we start out with a base assumption that we are the most intelligent thing, mm -hmm. and we get to define the terms of what intelligence is. So depending on how you use your language, uh, you can reframe the question. But thinking about things in terms of survival, I think trees are amazing organisms because they are able to respond to uh, these long-term changes uh, in the environment if people don't come along and cut them down, of course. Which is why there's this wonderful term, tree time, 
which is, again, comes to your point about we keep thinking about things in our own frame of reference, which is understandable, but what if there's a completely different set of frames of reference? So... No, what if? That there if, are. that's exactly right. <laughs> yes, there are different frames. And we, this one is only one. The, yes, <laughs> yes. Which is a mistake we always make, isn't it? We think it's the only one or the, the, the best one. one or yeah. the one. So... That brings us to obviously the important question before we lead on to the philosophical segment of tonight's discussion. <laughs> do, do you accept that or think or acknowledge or reject the idea that plants are sentient? Well, sentience means the ability to perceive and the ability to feel. And if you go by that basis, Plants can perceive their environment, quite obviously. We don't even need the experiments that we've done to, to convince you of that, I hope. But um, I always like the one with the giraffe and the acacia, because that, that's a really nice one. Mm. Um, can they feel things? Well, if, what do you mean by feel? They can respond to touch. Uh, they can respond to uh, chemicals that are produced by uh, other plants or fungi. They can respond to uh, the influence of animals, they can respond to herbivory and so on and so on. They perceive the world, they feel the world, therefore, surely by the definition of the term, then yes. Monica, anything to add? No. no. Okay. <laughs> So one, one thing actually, yeah. sorry, of course there's always one thing. <laughs> uh, the term sentience is actually an important one, not because um, it defines whether, uh, you know, plants in this case or others, non-humans in particular, um, are eligible <laughs> or not for the upper class of, you know, the special beings. But um, it's important because in legal terms, uh, the question of sentience uh, is one that was used, uh, I think, in was it around 2011? The Swiss government uh, decided to uh, put together a panel, and they wanted to know. They, they asked this group of people, uh, these like scientists and uh, social scientists, and all sorts of like people that works with ethics and, and lawyers and, and ask them to put together a questionnaire and then address certain questions to decide whether plants should, be, uh, should have moral and ethical considerations. And the question of sentience, of course, came up, and, uh, and not only came up, but it became the key based on which they decided whether, yes, they should or no, they shouldn't, or we don't know. And the problem is that they basically concluded after <laughs> quite an extensive amount of work because uh, I was in contact with one of the people on that board and she shared what you know went through and there was definitely a lot of work and a lot of thinking around these theme themes and uh, the conclusion was like basically we can't come up with any conclusion because we can't define sentience and we don't know if plants actually should qualify. The question of morality and ethics and whether you know they are worthy our consideration uh, it's almost like a, it's a stupid question yeah. but yes. no it is it's, it's a very silly question because again we're, we're thinking about it from our viewpoint exactly does the plant give a damn what we think about them and should they not uh, receive our consideration regardless of whether they are sentenced even if they were not sentenced yeah. so what that we, we, then we are free to do whatever we want, which is exactly what we are doing. And that's why sentence become a very loaded word. And in this context, is particularly important. But I have worked with a legal um, theorist and earth lawyer and, uh, here in Australia. And basically, we came to the conclusion that sentence has, as a concept has changed over time, which in itself tells you that actually we don't really know what we mean when we use it. So why such a fleety and so unspecified word should be used to define so clearly uh, whether plants in this case, but it could be anyone else, uh, should be deserving our respect? So it's an open question, but of course I hope that the answer is pretty clear as well. <laughs> so that really sums up the sciencey bit, if you like, of the, of the discussion, because we've gone through the evidence that started off with a, a really simple, elegant, you know, giraffes and acacias type study 
through to these deeply complex studies around fungi and wood wide webs to elegant experiments that really challenge everything we think about in terms of plants' capabilities to respond to environments, to, mem uh, to have memory, and to con we need to consider them as sentient. If you follow down that track, you then open up a whole mass of, of sort of conundra and issues that we face as, as a community. And I want to tackle these three, what, which is really about what does your work mean and now mean for us? What does it mean in understanding how the plants we live with um, and how we should be living with them and how we should be managing, quote unquote, managing plants? Um, what does it tell us about understanding the process of science and understanding our role in the environment? So the first thing then is from what we have learned about plants. What does this tell us about forestry and the way we should be, quote unquote, managing plants, agriculture, horticulture and the like? So this is more the sort of field that I tend to work in these days, uh, is thinking about how to go about doing uh, forestry uh, in a more ecologically sensible way. Um, we know that a tree is not just the plant. A tree is, uh, well, Lynn Margulis came up with this great word, a uh, holobiont, which is an organism uh, that depends on all these other organisms for it to be the way that it is. So with a tree, you have all its fungi, its bacteria, and uh, all these other organisms that contribute to how it uh, expresses its uh, physical form and how it interacts with the environment. Um, the way that we've tended to do forestry is to look at a forest and say, well, we really like pine trees. So what we're going to do is rather than have to go into a forest and pull out the pine trees, we're just going to grow a whole bunch of pine trees together in one place, kill everything else that tries to grow. That way we'll eliminate the competition because we're very, very primed to only think about competition as the important process uh, in ecology when in fact there's a whole spectrum of different interactions that organisms are involved in. Uh, and so we end up with these big monocultures of pine trees or eucalypts or uh, these horrible little Sitka spruce plantations that we have in Scotland that when I was a kid growing up I used to think that was what forest looked like. And then I went to the west coast of British Columbia, and instead of these Sitka spruce being these tiny little pole-like things that grew in dense square clusters, it turned out they're actually these massive great trees with trunks like this that could be two or three hundred years old and form these amazing ecosystems. The way that we've been going about forestry is to basically say, well, we know everything there is to know about how you manage things, so we'll grow lots of these trees together, they'll be really easy to cut down, uh, and then we'll just replant and it will all start over again. Um, and of course, what we've been discovering is that it doesn't work very well when you have wildfires going through and pest outbreaks, which both of which are increasing due to uh, climate change. With global warming, the average temperature of the planet is getting hotter and extreme events are occurring more often and it's usually the extreme events that end up killing things off. Uh, we get these big plantations, you get one pathogen comes in and it can wipe out most of the trees and there's, what, 100, 120 years worth of growth pretty much gone. The usual response is then, oh, we'd better go and cut everything down so we can make some money off it. <laughs> and then we have a nice barren cut block that we need to regenerate. So a lot of the work that I'm doing now is looking at how to leverage natural processes to help encourage uh, forest regeneration. Uh, and Suzanne Samard and I came up with this mother tree project uh, where we were able to uh, get some money from the Canadian government to go and investigate how different types of forest harvesting techniques uh, could be utilized in different environments uh, to improve your chances of restoring a forest afterwards. So forestry is one of those things where we've tended to apply a one-size-fits-all approach, and yet what we find is, of course, the same species different populations of that species can respond differently to different environmental cues. Over the distribution of a species, the environment changes. So the way that the plants interact with the environment uh, can change not only in situ, but as 
climate changes and you try and move it into different places. So what we're trying to do is use all of these natural uh, beneficial uh, interactions to help forests uh, to regenerate in a more sustainable way and to try and move away from this uh, monoculture, uh, try and make as much money off them as quickly as we can uh, type approach. And it's not just the, the monoculture issue, it's the lack of variation within the monoculture. Monica, you've got some quite strong views about um, oh. developing, or losing the variation within a species. They're not strong views. They would be very emotional. And as scientists, we are not <laughs> emotional about We're issues. We're going to get to that in a moment, <laughs> yes. But, <laughs> uh, well, no, it's, it's pretty simple. And we discussed this before. Um, and I have made this point uh, also in my writing, writing before. Um, monoculture, uh, they just simply do not make sense. And that's uh, as simple as it gets. It's like, uh, aside from, and unfortunately, uh, many of the monoculture are also associated with the, addic the additional problem of many of them are genetically modified uh, because GM works well in a monoculture system. Um, but the entire setup is, uh, it's not, I would say it's not scientific. Because uh, if you actually are being scientific about the issue without getting emotional and without getting involved in whether it's ethical or not, or whether it's good for you or not, those are other questions. But from a bare minimum, like, is this a scientifically valid approach? And the answer is clearly no, because science would tell you, and this is not me, because I'm not smart enough for that, but you know, even the, the theory, the Darwinian theory of evolution is based on you know, natural selection. How can anything be selected if everything is the same? You need variability. And in fact, the, we know well in ecological system, the most uh, the, the system that can cope best at times of hardship, like when you have a fire, when you have big uh, cyclones coming through, it doesn't matter whether this is a terrestrial marine system, the, the rule is the same. You need biodiversity levels high, as high as possible, because that is kind of like it's an insurance policy. Someone will go and will be taken, but there will be others who are just the right one that can make it. If you have only one type, like in a monoculture, and it just happened that your type is the wrong type <laughs> for the event that is coming, well, you lose everything. So monocultures, from a scientific perspective, are the antithesis of what nature is doing. They reduce variability, and they're not interested in biodiversity. And the problem with that, aside from the obvious, is the fact that not only uh, we, are, we know that you know, they are more susceptible and everything, but the crops, because that's how we call those plants, crops, <laughs> they're not plants. Uh, the crops that we are uh, using in our monoculture, some of them, some of the species, are already losing the capacity, uh, which we are just barely starting to appreciate. They're losing already the capacity to communicate, for example, in condition of where they can communicate for defense, like the acacia. They can tell others, hey, there is a problem over here. And this is actually, you know, we have scientific data to show that this is the case for plants like cacao. Can you imagine? No more chocolate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is serious. <laughs> okay, so on that point, we've got a second question from the audience, from Joe Frank, who said, I would like the panel to respond to the following. If trees can talk, think and heal, is there still a case for allowing clear felling of a forest, since that is the equivalent of ethnic cleansing? <laughs> I love that Hot question. question. Hot question, Joe. That is a great question. I hate clear cuts. <laughs> Not only are they awful to work in, uh, they're horrendously disturbed environments. Um, there are very few natural disturbances that would cause the sort of uh, disturbance to the soil uh, and to the trees as you get with a clear cut. Um, but oftentimes they're just absolutely vast and the assumption is if we go in and plant a bunch of seedlings in them then they're going to be able to take off and form a new forest and what you tend to find is that the bigger the clear cuts get the harder they are to regenerate why might that be 
if you scorch the earth and then expect it to instantly respond. I think there are lots of better ways to go about forestry. And really, by this point, we should know that clear fouling is not a good approach. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so that you mentioned um, just briefly a moment ago about science and scientists and how scientists behave and respond. And we tend to think of scientists as objective, cold, hard, unemotional characters, usually middle-aged men with bad hair, wearing a lab coat. Um, I'm trying to get... You are indeed breaking, look, breaking the mould here. Um, and also taking a reductionist view of the world, that, that we can understand everything if we just look at the component parts. How do you think your work challenges that paradigm? Should we be thinking about the way we conduct science differently? Would you like to go first? <laughs> really? Would you like me? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I guess I already gave it away, isn't it? That uh, I don't really believe uh, in uh, the illusion of objectivity in science. And I qualify this. It doesn't mean that I can just do whatever I want and then I call it science and everyone is happy. What I mean is that there is a method. There are many ways of looking at the world, first of all. Science is one of the many ways. And science is different from other ways simply because it's got a particular method that follows certain rules. The method of science is the objective method because it's got certain objectives, it's got certain rules. But how we approach whichever system it is that we are looking at, plants, animals, it doesn't really matter, uh, we cannot not acknowledge that the scientist or the human is in the picture. And uh, inevitably, everything that we do as scientists is done through our, own, our human eyes and our human being in the space. So we are part of the experiment every single time. And uh, believe that we are not, and so creating this myth of objectivity as if we can observe without interference, meaning we're not there, because that's what we really mean when we are talking about objectivity. It's like, you, you just pretend that you're not there. It's like, but I am there. <laughs> and in some system, if you, if you talk about science in laboratory where everything is super controlled, maybe, I don't know, because it's not really the kind of science that I like doing. But if you're actually working in the field, in the real world of animals and plants and organisms doing their thing, well, in some situation, for example, if you work with baboons and uh, you pretend that you're not there <laughs> because that's the objectivity of your method, and a baboon is giving you signals like, I'm quite pissed off right now, and if you don't move now, I'm going to attack you and rip you to shreds. Well, I think that it's pretty stupid to, to say that it's objective to don't do anything. In fact, I know colleagues, and we are right now in the process of writing this, um, I think, brave uh, proposal uh, to talk about empathy in the context of the uh, construction and production of scientific knowledge and the role that empathy plays, because without empathy, so without this ability of the human to literally project itself into the other and imagine what it would be like to be there and appreciate that there is someone there that is the same as the one here looking back at you, uh, without that sensitivity, we are actually missing into the beauty and the nuances and the essence of the very thing that we are trying to describe. So if anything, uh, the objectivity has indeed reduced what we can describe of the world instead of making any better science. And so we are really, um, I think we are at a time where we not only need to acknowledge the human in the picture again, uh, but also uh, realize that well, because we are here, and this could be extrapolated as well in the bigger issue, you know, that we are seeing in the world, but because we are here, we are totally part of the experiment. We are totally part of the situation. We are totally part of the problems that we see. And pretend that we are not, and we can just watch them with detachment, that is very, very dangerous. 
and it's not really true anyway. So it's kind of like bury the head in the sand and pretend that you're not there. It's like, but you are there and your heart is sticking out. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we can put paid to objectivity. <laughs> Brian, your work is the antithesis of reductionism, really, isn't it? You're talking about ecology in general? And your work in particular, but yeah, you're, you're, you're moving to that, that grander field of, of ecology as opposed to what used to be traditionally described as zoology or botany. Or, uh, so, so my research covers a whole bunch of different scales, uh, everything from uh, using DNA uh, to identify different species of fungi, uh, through very, very controlled lab experiments uh, looking at the transfer of nutrients between uh, different plants, uh, between plants and fungi, uh, and so on, uh, up to large-scale field experiments where we're trying to understand how uh, seedlings are interacting with mature trees and fungi in different environments, uh, in different places, different populations of the same species, different populations of different species, how all these things are interacting in the real world. Um, and so it covers this whole range of different interactions. And yeah, you can be really objective and set up really nice lab experiments where um, your peers will go, hmm, you did a really good job. That's, uh, <laughs> it's difficult to argue with, uh, with the results of that experiment. Uh, through to working with natural ecosystems where there are so many variables that if you want to control your variables, you are inevitably changing the outcome for the system. So we're doing all these experiments in the lab and we're doing them in the greenhouse and in my field we're ten tending to work with seedlings because for some reason they won't give you 50 years worth of funding to grow a bunch of trees and then yeah. study them the later. Fundamental it's very, it's, it's system, isn't it? very flawed system. So most of my work is actually with seedlings and this stuff with trying to label yeah. mature trees is a new approach to trying to get around that issue. But we know that seedlings interact with a different, or they don't always, but they often interact with a different and reduced set of mycorrhizal fungi compared to mature trees. So you already know that there's a different level going on there. And the fungi are interacting with different bacteria. And you have plant growth promoting bacteria and bacteria that promote the symbiosis. There's all these different layers there. When you're working with seedlings, you, we, we do all these great experiments and we see all these interesting things happening, but you cannot then say, well, that's what the mature tree is doing as well. Mm -hmm. You need to go out and see what's happening with a mature tree. And if you're talking about a 200-year-old tree, that tree has had to, it, it's come from a seed, that seed landed in the soil, and it happened to be one of the ones that managed to survive because it was able to form associations with other organisms. The conditions happen to be right for it to be able to grow. Um, it's experienced all these different periods of change. It's been able to respond to those different changes without moving. It's been in place the whole time. So having to respond to all these changes. Um, trying to then package that up into a highly objective experiment where you only test one or two differences, you're always going to miss uh, something. And because you can't measure everything, and even if we could measure everything, would we actually be able to understand how all the different processes were A, interacting with each other, and B, how the tree was interpreting those mm -hmm. different responses? So, yes, I do lots of very objective scientific experiments where you can package things up. <laughs> so, you. Yeah. And, you know, like with the how are the plants responding to the, the light and the sound. That's a really nice experiment that you can do in a lab. I've also done stable isotope probing out in the field. And trying to do this stuff out in the field is it's great because you decide the week that you're going to do your research, it's 40 degrees at 6 in the morning. And when you're out in the sun, in the cut block that you're trying to regenerate, you're getting attacked constantly by horse flies. And when you go into the shade of the surrounding forest to try and get a bit of a break from the sunshine, you get murdered by mosquitoes. Yeah. <laughs> and you're doing this all day, and you're putting these little sampling bags on these seedlings, and then injecting uh, 13 C-labeled 
CO2 so that the plant has to photosynthesize with 13C, which it would normally discriminate against, so that then when you come back a week later and look to find out where the 13C is gone, you know that it had to have been photosynthesized by that seedling. And as soon as you start the experiment, you're on a timeline because you have to go to every site and start the experiment and finish it in the same amount of time because different types of signals uh, are, happen on different, type, different scales. So the signaling compounds, when you talk about when a plant gets attacked by an insect, those signaling compounds get transferred really quickly. Mm. When you want to look at where um, nutrients are getting transferred to, when they're getting converted into biomass and stored in a plant, that can take a week, two weeks maybe, uh, to go into one plant, get transferred into the fungi, and get moved around. So depending on the question you're trying to ask, you're working with different time scales in the field, maybe it's going to rain the day that you did your experiment, and that's going to change the way that the plant's interacting with the soil. And how's that going to have a knock-on effect to what you discover at the end? And so I like doing the greenhouse experiments, because then you know exactly what <laughs> yeah, happened. Yeah. But when you then go out into the field and start doing these experiments, you're like, oh, well, this is what happened on Wednesday, so hopefully a week down the line when we come and sample these things, maybe we won't see the signal of that thing that happened. You just, it's layer on layer of complexity, and it's, it's wonderful working in ecology yeah. because there's always new crazy questions or you ask what you think is a simple question and then you get a horribly complicated answer that leads to more I know more the feeling. I, I get that. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so... Any we, problems? We, <laughs> any problems? <laughs> so we've challenged some of the fundamental aspects of science. The, the last one I want to do, outside of just reductionism and objectivity, is language. Ooh, and we got a great question. Um, oh, no, it is going to be a problem. <laughs> we got a great question from Dame Roddy Emblem. I'm not sure that's a real name, but... Um, and, um, who asked, a question I would like to put to your panel regarding talking trees and other speakers who present talks on similar subjects concerns praxeology, na the praxeology nature of their studies. The term science embraces all knowledge, while anthropocentric praxeology concerns itself largely with aspects of the natural world that have interest for humans, and especially those that may be of use to humans. Praxeology should not be confused with science. So I guess what that question is really challenging is, do we only like to do the science that relates to us. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, there won't be time left for you. We do have to keep it short. We're at 7.22 and I haven't got on to the good one. <laughs> but two questions to go. Well, okay. So I think in science, well, we're trying to uh, accumulate knowledge um, and understand the way that the world works. Whatever field you go into, uh, we, we really like to partition science up. This is a, a human thing. We like to decide that the type of science that I'm doing is ecology, and the type of science that Brian Cox is doing is astrophysics. And it's all a way of partitioning up this grand area of science, trying to explain the natural world. Um, after a while, you start to partition that up into so many different things that you start to wonder why we're just giving all these different names to what is essentially an exploration of trying to understand the world. Uh, and I would argue that with the types of experiments uh, that we're doing, it is very much science that we're doing. Uh, the interpretation of the results uh, is always open to uh, human interpretation because we're all humans, so that's, that's just how that works. I guess, um, well, I actually had to go and check what that big word meant. So did I. Because talking about languages, I have no idea. <laughs> but aside from that, I guess the only thing that uh, I might want to add is that, um, well, first of all, um, at least, and I'm, I, I know from Susan that uh, the same is true for the kind of research that you guys have been doing, but I know that my research is being used by many other disciplines, uh, from the arts to literature and philosophy, law, economics. Uh, so 
science, uh, whether we like it or not, is not isolated in a silo and it just stays there. It will uh, have it has consequences, and, it, and what we find will get interpreted in very different ways depending on the who is looking into. And ultimately, at least talking for myself in the science that I do, or what drives me for the science that I do, is um, of course it's the human. It's the only one that hasn't got it, like that didn't get it. The plants don't need to know that they are intelligent, that they can do all these things. They're doing those things, and they don't need the human to confirm. Ah, oh, now, okay, now that you yeah. pass the Pavlovian <laughs> P test, you're good to go. Um, so it is, of course, it is all about the human. But then the question is, like, uh, does the human need so desperately science to tell what the world is about? As I said before, it's one way of exploring the world. As a scientist, I really like it, of course, and it's a beautiful way, like making music or painting. So that, that really brings me to my last section, um, which is really about us and nature. So your work tells us a huge amount about our role within nature, not standing aside from it, not looking onto it as if it's some strange planet out there that really we don't interact with. And I had a whole lot of questions, but I got completely gazumped by Bob Reeson, who sent through two questions, which will be my very last two. Seriously, my last two? Oh. Okay. Um, Bob said, firstly, Inga Simpson wrote in the novel Where the Trees Were, these trees were significantly carved and symbolically marked trees. It must have been obvious to all that they were important historically. Obviously, First Nations people considered that they could perhaps talk, think and heal. Comment on Indigenous people and their relationships and what should we be learning from those relationships, observations and connections? Sure. So one of the great things about the Mother Tree Project uh, that Suzanne Samard and I have been doing in British Columbia is that we got a lot of interest from First Nations communities uh, out in BC. And a lot of, like you're saying, the concepts that we were talking about in terms of the facilitation of new trees by other trees through these fungal networks and the idea of old trees uh, having intrinsic value and passing on information to uh, new trees in the forest was very much in touch with uh, First Nations beliefs. Mm -hmm. And so we've actually been able to establish uh, several study sites uh, in collaboration with First Nations in British Columbia, uh, which I think is fantastic. Oh, brilliant. And so we've, we've got not just the original study sites that, that we thought we were going to have, but we've had all this uh, uptake and, and been able to uh, get First Nations involved in the research. And Monica, you have worked with Indigenous peoples around the world. I'd like to have worked more, <laughs> uh, simply because, well, two things, I guess, um, because I know we are running out of time. One, uh, I'd like to highlight the fact that we are not um, with nature, looking at nature, we are nature. Two, we have forgotten this. And this is where indigenous people comes in and probably to me, uh, probably one of the most important things, whatever is up there, <laughs> uh, probably the most important life-saving thing that we have at this stage. Because these are the people, the part of humanity, because they're not them and us, they are the part of the humanity that live in all of us, uh, who have maintained the remembering of what we are, nature. And so by connecting with them in terms of like the knowledge that belongs to all of us, that is the inheritance of humanity, we might have a chance to remember who we are, our place in the context, in the relating of, the, of this. And, uh, and once that becomes clear and strong again, the decision to be made are going to be so easy and, and obvious. The only reason why we are so struggling to make the right decision, even if they are staring us in the face, is not because we can't see them, but simply because we believe we can't make them. Because we're coming from a mind that doesn't realize our place. And so I am 
not grateful, beyond grateful, because pretty much most of my science in plants is being totally inspired uh, and more by both indigenous stories, indigenous interaction, indigenous everything. Mm. So uh, for me, uh, the human to remember uh, what human actually is, it needs to remember the, the roots. And they are the older yeah. of those roots. Fantastic. Thank you. And, and that really leads on to my final question, which was put so beautifully by Bob Reeson again. So I'll read this out. He said, I have a history of planting great gardens, and I would say that I am off to talk to the plants. This wasn't a reflection of me thinking that they wouldn't answer back but enabled me to notice the daily small changes in leaves, buds, and watch for predators. However, I must say it grew on me, and I would find myself talking to the plants. Comment, please. Good on you. <laughs> I think sometimes it feels like you can have a more sensible conversation yeah. with a plant. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, that's forming that connection with plants, isn't it? That, that it he is now deeply connected with nature in a way that we have lost for the vast majority. Um, forgotten. We, forgotten. We haven't we lost anything. Lost. Do you think no. we still got it? Yeah. Well, that gives us great hope for the future Absolutely. then, doesn't it? So, look, I think on that note, um, I would like you all to join me in thanking Monica and Brian. <laughs> a, a, Thank you. Thank you. Ah, mine Thank you. Thank you. Brian, Monica and Chris. Thank you so much. Uh, a lot of food, food for thought plant for thought. So thank you again for joining us. Now, on the weekend, I hope you've got your tickets to WOMAD because Monica and Brian will be speaking at 12 o'clock on Saturday. Um, which is not the 9th of March. And Brian is also going to be talking about the magic of mushrooms. <laughs> it's a great it's title. Not the magic it's a mushrooms. Title. That's what it says. The magic of. Oh, I'm going to have to change this is on <laughs> <laughs> This is on Sunday um, at what time? One o'clock. That's an appropriate time to speak about magic mushrooms. Anyway, so a video, again, a reminder, a video of tonight's presentation available on our Hawk Centre website next week and copies of Monica's book, Thus Spoke the Plant, is available for purchase in the foyer now and the lovely Monica will be signing books and having chats to people who would like to come up and buy a purchase book. Um, again, thank you, and make sure you head into WOMAD. Vic, I'm sure there's tickets still available, only a few, um, for some fantastic global music and performances, um, you know, visual arts, all sorts of wonderful things. So have a beautiful long weekend. Enjoy, and um, thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.